we are going to begin. We're talking about emotionally healthy leader. We're really going to do like unpack one of the points that I brought out a little bit more and a little bit deep, deeper today, you know, um, uh, in there, I basically tried to kind of make a big, uh, uh, paint a big picture of just kind of how do we navigate the cultural divide, navigate the tensions of, and, you know, talk about kind of those three components, but I want to kind of, I want to focus in today on that second one, uh, when we're talking about this idea of struggle, right? And how do we stay emotionally healthy in the, in the midst of our struggle, right? If, if we have to wrestle with the tension of that God, life is tragic and God is faithful and God has um, put us in, he named us, he named his people struggle, Israel. Um, the question is, is how do we struggle um, well? And those two uh, bedrocks are two of the things that I want to take a deep dive in this really thinking through um, thinking through that because, uh, you know, there's so much theology around wilderness. I don't know if anybody's ever done a study on this kind of wilderness, the, the wilderness and just like the so many different periods of the children of Israel going to the wilderness, Jesus in the wilderness, you know, and just you just see kind of the seasons of wilderness in that period. And, uh, you know, and I think part of it is, is that um, whether you know it or not, basically, Either you are going into a wilderness, you're in a wilderness, or you're coming out of a wilderness, right? And that's just kind of uh, a fact um, that we have and that we're in. And so the question is, is like, if we're going to be in our wilderness and if we're going to struggle, how do we struggle well? How do we stay emotionally healthy? How do we, how do we continue to engage in a way that honors, that honors um, God? Right. And um, so I think it's really important because once you come to the reality that there is no such place called away, like how many times have you wanted just like, I just want to get away. Right. I just want to get away. And then you realize you got away and you took all your problems with you. Right. And it's, you're still there. And it's like there, you recognize that there's no place called away, even like we put our trash in a dumpster. But it doesn't like. It doesn't go, just disappear. It doesn't go away. It goes. That's why we have all the ozone problems. And, you know, it's just like it doesn't go away. Right. You know, and there's a thing. And that's actually what's interesting. There's a place called, you know, when we talk about Gehenna, Gehenna was basically the, the trash dump. It was the place where they would send all the trash. And I think oftentimes we think that things are going away, but they're not, they're not going away. What it, oftentimes we become real good at burying, um, stuffing, pushing aside, avoiding, neglecting, you know, um, our emotions in so many different ways. So the question becomes is how can we um, remain healthy in the midst of our struggle? How do we remain healthy in the midst of our struggle? Do you understand, you know, and I, and I, I mentioned in there, the, this the moment that we are in, um, do you understand that there was a, a company that they just came in, they, they just did a research and they said, do you know what the most Google words and phrases are right now? The most Googled words and phrases are things that you would probably know on the front end, like anxiety test, depression, loneliness, isolation. Like those are the most Googled words, the anxiety, depression, like this is happening. Right. But one of the things that even though that's one of the that's some of the most Googled words and phrases. What's also interesting is that one of the most Googled phrase also is what does God say about blank? What does God say about our anxiety, our depression, our right? And this kind of reminds me of the statement that I start off with. The harvest really is plentiful, but it's the laborers that are few. People are wanting to know what to do with the tragic nature of life, right? So we recognize and we know and over and over again confirm and affirm that life is tragic. That, that we see that by the words that people are searching for, the, what people are asking for. But what people don't have is the recognition and the realization that God is faithful, that Christ doesn't just yell from the heavens, but he takes on flesh and he tabernacles amongst us. He become present with us. But instead of us being present, what we do is that we try to get away. We try to escape. One of my mentors basically says 90 percent of ministry is just simply showing up. It's just being present. And we're not just talking about being present, like physically present, but we're talking about physically, spiritually, emotionally present. 
Have you guys ever seen that? I think it's the movie with Adam Sandler, Click. You know, seen that? You seen the movie? It's kind of like he just uh, he he was just like I could be physically in these places, but I just want to get away all the time. And he would just kind of fast forward through his life, and then he realized that oh, what have I done, right? And that's and I think oftentimes that's the way we try to live life is that we try to disconnect, disattach, disassociate, and we're not able to be present in the midst of the struggle that God has placed us in, in this tension between the, the, the tragic nature of God and the faithfulness of God. So the question becomes is what is God's answer? What is God's answer to our faithfulness? And I would want to say the Bible tells us that we to love the Lord your God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, that basically I don't think he calls us to categorize him like heart, minds, like in this. But I think he, ultimately he's saying, love him with everything. Love him holistically with all. Don't withhold anything. But the problem is, is that as leaders, many of our um, environments, many of our, our teaching, many of our discipleship models are only hitting the top half. When I'm going to talk about top half versus bottom half, that we're only hitting kind of mind and we're only hitting our actions, right? And so many of our Christian, this is the way we think. If we think the love of the Lord God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, um, what we end up going is, is that, we, you know, we've even probably said the statement, believe this, if, if they, you get the person to think right, then they will what? act right, right? If I can just get people to think and believe right about God, then they will act right in accordance. And what happens is, is that we stay what I call above the line. And above the line is believe this, do this, believe this, do this, believe this, do that. And what we are unable to do is to go the 18 inches down from our head into our hearts, right? The 18 inches, that is one of the longest journeys that you and I have. And it's one of the most scariest journeys that we that we that we have. And so we don't get down into the lower side of it, that if you look at this and you just see it as the top side of it, the top part of it is more of the doing. And then the bottom is the being you guys, you know, we we've had that debate for years in Christianity, doing versus being Mary versus Martha. Right. That that tension between the two. What are we called to to do? What are we called to be? And I, again, and I think that Mary and Martha not to be pitted against one another. But if we were to choose, the idea was that we are to sit at the feet of Jesus. We are to sit and recognize that the, our Christianity is not about religion. It's not about what we do. It's not about the do's and don'ts, but it's about relationship. You you guys have heard the statement that Christianity is not a religion, it's relationship. At Blueprint Church, we say Christianity is not a religion, but it's relationships. It's our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our relationship with our neighbors, right? And if, if Christianity is about relationships, the question is, is how do I do healthy relationships well? How do I create right, the right relationship Right. This idea of righteousness there. And so what I want to propose to you is that instead of just continue the same models of just, hey, let's find the best, the best, next greatest book or the next best, best latest podcast and just go to Starbucks and just simply just change and swap ideas and, and change and swap kind of facts with one another, that we would begin to look at some of our models of disciple making and discipleship with our students in a different way. I love the video. I love the video that they have because it says like we just we want to get out of just simply just tra knowledge transfer, right? But he's the, the people who said they're inviting college students into their home. That's something that my wife and I did at the very beginning. We've been married for 21 years and 18 out of the 21 years, we've had people live with us in our home. 18, because it was something that was core. And it really came from the book, a book called Master Plan of Evangelism, where it was just simply, the, he says, Jesus was with them. And I was just like, how, if Jesus was with them, how can we be with one another? How do we recapture the art of hospitality? How do we be present with one another? Because here we are, we have people arguing about Arminian and Calvin and dispensation and all. Like, and I was just like, but you don't even know how to treat a woman. You don't know how to pay your bills. You don't know how to just relate to people and family. And like, but they're arguing all these super lapsarian and like all these words. It's like, I don't like, who cares? And then... And then what we would do is that like we would then go and then we would try to minister to people. And we were just like, 
We don't know how to relate. We don't know how to relate to our neighbors. We don't know how to connect. We don't know how to, because you know, that empathy muscle, it just seems like no one is training and no one is discipling. No one is teaching around how do we be in better relationships. So going from this model to, I would say, a model that we start obviously with the teaching, we start with God's word, but going down the 18 inches into our heart, integrating into our soul before we try to start asking for how do we flesh this out? How do we flesh this out? There's three words that I want you to remember um, in this. When we talk about being emotionally healthy, right? In the midst of our wilderness experience. And the three words are this. Number one is I want you to understand how do you identify, explore, and express. Identify, explore, and express. Ultimately, what I want to do is teach you a word, teach you kind of the undergirding of words that you have been saying all of your Christian life, but probably have not been really explained to in fully. I want to help you to become better at both confessing and repenting, because that's going to make you better at relationships. Confessing and repenting. You were just like, oh, well, I didn't come here to talk about confession. And how does confession help me be better emotionally? When I talk about the word confession, ultimately what the definition that I'm using about confession is a willingness to tell the truth about what's going on inside. Con- confessing is a willingness to tell the truth about what's going on inside. So if you understand my understanding of confession, what I'm not saying when I talk about confession, that confession is not only confessing the bad things that you've done wrong. And oftentimes when we think about confession, that's what we think. And I, you know, I've, I've been in that city group or that DNA group or that accountability group where you're trying to figure out, okay, what do I say? What do I say? You know, do I, do I say it all? Do I say a little bit? Do I, right? And, and then it becomes, and as soon as the first person confesses and tells the truth about something, and then everybody else goes into fix it, Felix mode, right? And then the next hour is spent on fixing this person because they was the first person and the only person willing to be vulnerable, right? And what we've become is professional fixers of, of, of one another. And there's this kind of codependence and weird thing that we have is because a part of it is that we don't know how to deal with one another's hearts. We don't know how to interact with one another's confessions, right? And so the first thing is that, are we willing to tell the truth about what's going on inside, right? The second thing is that when we talk about confession is the idea of repentance. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, metanoia, which basically means to change. So at the very core of repentance, it doesn't mean to repent from the bad things that you are doing. Repentance means to change. And let me just say this, if you are able to tell the truth about what's going on inside, it will change the way you see both yourself and see God. That if you become better at confession, it will lead to a life that's marked with repentance, right? And so when we talk about this emotionally healthy spirituality, we're not talking about words that and things that God is not familiar with. And we're talking about things that he is very intimately familiar with. And I really believe that he's he, he very introduced that some of the core tenets that we just haven't talked about because we have created a, a, a religiosity about just simply believe this and do that, right? Everyone ought to look the same, act the same, talk the same, right? And that's how we measure faithfulness instead of someone like David. If you look at all the people that God is like, talks about David, um, Abraham, like these were some wicked people. I know, I mean, I probably never heard that message, but like David, like he took a guy, murdered him, took his wife, married him. And it was just like, I think you think he would get his lesson. No, he did it again. Right. He took another wife. And I mean, he was just doing some things. Abraham was a habitual liar everywhere he went. Wasn't trusting God. He kept lying over and over again. Like you can see the scriptures. But what we see, we see Abraham, the father of the faith. Um, David, a man after God's own heart. These are the models because maybe it's not about our like Christianity. The goal of Christianity is not perfection. Right. And that's what all of us think that Christianity, the goal of our our Christianity is perfection. Maybe it's more about presence. It's not about perfection, it's about being present, because think about it, when sin entered into the world, what happened? Right. Relationships was torn. It was God and man walking in the cool of the day, present with one another. It was man and woman 
present with one another and sin brings about a divide. So the goal of our Christianity is about reconciliation and we are to fight for that reconciliation. And that's why it's so important of when we talk about the divide, that this is not a tertiary issue because everything that we do when we preach the gospel, when we do all those is about reconciliation. We're about, we're talking about being reconciled to God because our sin has divided us. So as I'm addressing sin, I'm not addressing sin just simply so that we can be perfect because you're never going to get that news flash. None of us is going to reach perfection. The goal is being reconciled, that we walk with our God, that we walk with one another, that we walk with our neighbors and we bring all of ourselves to, to one another. Right. And we, we get away from what, what I call crowded loneliness. Crowded loneliness with a bunch of people around, but no one knows me. I'm not connecting with no one, but it's because of our unwillingness to confess or repent. But if you are not able to confess and repent, you won't be healthy. You cannot and will not be healthy if you're not able to tell the truth about what's going on inside and to change who you are. If you're not able to identify, explore and express. Right. So who's in this movie? Right. You see that? Love the movie. Right. And in the whole type of the movie, we recognize that in all of the movie, the only thing that any of us wants to be is joy. Right? We want constant joy. And, you know, we don't like anger. We definitely don't like sadness. Right. We don't like all of the things. And, you know, but at the end, the whole I think the whole point of the movie basically comes to the point that saying that is that all even your sadness is important for you to experience true joy. Even your sadness, everything has a place for you to live the full and abundant life, right? But most of us have been taught to run away from all of our emotions from day one. We've been taught. And so this is why what we do is that we live what I would call an impaired expression. We are an impaired version of ourselves because we're not willing to tell the truth. Remember, because we're dealing with life is tragic and there's things that you can't control, right? Because you can't control people. You can't control circumstances. You, can, this, you can't control, right? And this is why you have all the phobias, right? Agoraphobia, arachnophobia, all the phobias. What they are trying to do is to try to control their environment, right? Um, but they can in their limitations. And so we see this idea. So when I talk about the, the goals of just kind of what I want to do today, and we're going to hopefully run through it real quick and then us have some time for this interaction. We go until 1145. So I'm going to try to get this content in about 30 minutes and then we'll we'll dialogue for the last 15 minutes in there. But these are the, the four goals of this time. One is to acknowledge the feelings, right? We have God has given us feelings as God's tools to connect our heads to our hearts. How do we go below the line? What I'm going to argue is that God has given us eight, eight, eight words. All of this, a lot of this content comes from a book called The Voice of the Heart. Have you guys, anybody read that book? Chip Dodd, The Voice of the Heart. If you didn't write that down, everyone needs to read that book. And if you're not a reader, just Google Voice of the Heart and listen to it on video or whatever. But this is the baseline, right? It's going to help you better confess um, what you do tell the truth. And what we're going to say is it's like there's three primary colors. Basically, we're saying that there's eight primary emotions. And then every emotion that we can consider and imagine is going to come as a mixture of these eight primary emotions. It's like every color imagine is comes out of a mixture of those. So we're going to uh, we're going to establish this as God's tools that connect our heads to our heart. We're going to establish a baseline vocabulary with these eight foundational feelings. We're going to give you tools to navigate these feelings, right? Of identify, explore, and express these tools. And then we're going to identify the needs to embrace your neediness. Oh my gosh, I said it. There's a word that I know that no one feels comfortable with is that you were built to be needy. Needy, like needy. Who likes hanging around needy people? Who likes being needy, but is at the very core of what you confessing in the gospel. You guys remember the verse, blessed are the needy, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those. You see, it's once you're willing to tell the truth, right? The Bible says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change the way you see yourself, change the way you see God, because God's kingdom is at hand. How? I think... The Beatitudes is 
a way. And I'm going to show that. The Beatitudes is a way giving us a roadmap of how we ought to be healthy in the midst of this. So, all right, you guys. So we're going to leave here all being needy. Yes, you came here to learn how to be needy. Really, I just think there's two great questions that you need to be really good at. What do you feel and what do you need? What do you feel and what do you need? What do you feel? What do you need? All right. So those two questions, if you be the better that you are at getting those questions, the better you are will be navigating life. Right. All right. So there it is. My two questions. What, where am I? What do I need? Where do I get those from? Basically, when sin enters into the world, you know what the first question or the first, um, the first question <coughs> happened? You, who knows? Sin enters into the world. Genesis chapter three. God comes down, God is walking in, and he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you? I don't think Jesus or God was talking about like GPS, you know, like you are here. That's not what he was saying. And, and, and Adam responds appropriately. What he says, I was afraid, so I hid. You see the order of that? He first confessed where he was, I was afraid, and it's because of that emotion that drove him to do something. I was afraid, so I hid, right? One of the things that you, uh, you understand is that your emotions, a lot of times when they talk about the heart, is the seedbed, to, it's, the, it's what drives, right? There's many things, I won't get scientific in here, but they talk about the brain, right? You know, the amygdala, all those, you know, the things in the brain, I'm just gonna stop there. But like in the brain, they talk about there's a parental side of your brain and then there's an emotional side of your brain. Right. And as you receive things, you, you receive things in your emotional brain. And as your emotional brain comes, then it's your parenting brain that comes and tries to rationalize what's make, what's going on emotionally. So you receive information emotionally and it's then your parental brain. And this is why Jesus oftentimes tells us to be like parents. No. What did he tell us? Be like children. Return to who you are supposed to be because we're too smart and we're, we're trying to figure everything out. And what we've done is that we've written out all of our emotions because we're adult, adult, adults. Right. And we don't know what to do with what's going on inside of us because there is this war raging inside of us. And so how do we do it? So the better that we are able to talk about where we are, then lead out, express what we need the better we are, we will be in navigating life, right? So they already said this confession is telling the truth about what's going on inside. So here's some of the disclaimer about this. What I'm talking to you guys about is not about utopia. You're not, this is not about utopia, right? This is not a better life now. You're not like, it's like what I'm, what I'm introducing to you is hard. It's hard work. And you're going to like if you accept what I'm going to teach you and talk to you about, it's not going to make your life easier. It's probably going to make your life harder, but it's going to help you live the way you've been made to live. Right. Because what we have the reason why Americans are so addicted, because we've learned how to cope. We have tons of coping mechanisms to get away from what we feel, get away from having to engage our hearts. Right. So it's hard work. Right. And it's exhausting. Like you can make a decision to be, to confess and repent and to live emotionally healthy right now, but it doesn't last until like next hour. You have to remake the decision. And it's like every moment you're going to have to make the decision. Am I going to be present? Or am I going to run? Am I going to be present? Or am I going to run? Am I going to tell the truth about what's going on inside of me? Or am I going to hide? Right. It's exhausting. It's constant. Right. It seems like it's unrewarding. You're going to start confessing to people, telling people the truth about what's going on inside and people are don't, it's not going to know what to do with it. They're not going to know what to do with it. And it's going to put you in a very vulnerable place. And then that's going to stir up some new emotions in you. Right. Right. And, and that what I'm just saying to you is all scary. That's scary. All of this stuff. So let me just say, like, the odds are stacked against you. Right now, as we talk about being emotionally healthy there, there, this is just real. I mean, a lot of the books that are about kind of emotional health and those types of things, you know, what ends up happening is that they're just they're, they're trying to teach us how to avoid traumatic situations. And the, the reality is that you can't avoid you can limit them, but you can't avoid them. So how do we be present 
right? How do we be present? So basically the roadmap, what we see, the Bible tells us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is given in Matthew chapter nine. Guess what happened? Right after the wilderness experience, right after the wilderness experience, and even before the wilderness has been, do you know that um, right after probably one of the greatest moments in history, right, with the dove descending on Jesus, the dove descended on Jesus and the father spoke, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. God has been silent for 400 years. He hasn't spoken since Malachi. He comes and he breaks his silence. He says, it's Jesus. He's my son. I'm pleased in him. He's right. Everybody. This is probably one of the greatest moments. They've been waiting for him for 400 years, waiting for him to come. One of the greatest moments. You know what happened right after that? Matthew chapter four, one, right after that, Matthew four, one says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness experience wasn't the devil. It wasn't all like the spirit led. The devil was there in the wilderness, but he was led to the wilderness by the spirit of God. Does that, how does that wrestle with your theology? All right. And so we're in this period. Jesus goes through. We know kind of the wilderness experience. And then he comes out and, you know, it says from that time, Jesus's ministry, he began to preach. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change the way you see yourself. Because God's kingdom is at hand. And then he goes on. He begins, invites his disciples and he gets the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are those who are spiritually broke. Blessed are those who are humble, right? Blessed are those who are who grieve because no one likes to be broke. But blessed are those who grieve. And then it goes on. Blessed are those who sober are sober minded, who has a sober minded understanding of themselves. But then it moves on. And then basically says, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'll stop there. But that just gives us a road, a quick roadmap. Basically, life is tragic and we're spiritually bankrupt to do much about it. We grieve that reality. We embrace our humanity. I'm not God, but I'm still going to hunger and thirst for God's way to be done. Think about that. He just gave us a roadmap that is so sad. Right. I mean, it's just like relationally, but he's, he's dealing all these things about dealing with the heart because he also gives us, but he comforts us. He and so we see this and you just can walk through the Beatitudes and see this, the, this roadmap that God has given us. So why? Why do we do it? Because it's worth the pain. It's the only way to true intimacy. It's the pathway of being known. Like you, you, it's only through the pain that you have relationship. It's the only way to empathy. I talk oftentimes up there on the stage about empathy. It's the only way. It's the roadmap. Unless you are able and willing to navigate your own heart, you are not going to be able to help others to navigate theirs and go through their pain. Right. It's the only way. It's the way to empathy. Right. We see this. Um, I don't have the video on, but Brene Brown has a video that talks about empathy. I, I think it's, it's good for everybody to go see. It's not up here for the sake of time. I just wanted to reference it. But Brene Brown empathy. Google it on YouTube. All right. And it brings God glory. This is what we're made for. If Christianity is not about religion, but it's about relationship, then ultimately our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our relationship with our neighbors, as painful as they will be. It's about bringing God glory. It's worth the pain. It's worth the pain. All right. So. But we, and I know that you, we have learned how to hide out, how to try to get away, how to try to escape. Um, Sarah Groves has a, a song that says, there are so many ways to hide. There are so many ways not to feel. There are so many ways to deny what is real. But I just showed up for my own life and I'm standing here taking it, taking it in. And it sure looks bright for the glory of God is man fully alive. Right. There's no shortcut, but we got to learn how do we live our life with passion? This is the book, The Voice of the Heart. 
a guy named Chip Dodd, and he gives us basically these, these eight, and I'm gonna help us to go through this idea of identifying, and exploring, and express, all right? So, feelings are the truth about you, and if you can't face your feelings, you can't face the truth about yourself. Feelings are the truth about you, and if you can't face your feelings, then you can't face yourself. Are we willing to tell the truth about what's going on inside, right? The four realities that we can't escape, right? You, you'll try to, but you can't escape. The best you're going to get in life is clumsy. The best you're going to get in life is clumsy, right? You can try the best, but even doctors, you know, what do they what we call it? They, they practice. We spend most of life practicing. And like how many of us, like I remember, like I'm taking my son, he's in ninth grade playing basketball. And, you know, I play sports or whatever. And what I always say, man, if I knew what I knew now back then, I would be great, awesome. Like, and that's what then. But then when I think about parenting teenagers, I tell my kids all the time, I was like, listen, this is the first time I've ever parented teenagers. This is the first time you ever are parenting. Or the first time you're being a teenager. So we're both just trying to figure this thing out. Right, it is coming to grips. The best that we're gonna get is that we're, we're all trying to figure it out. It's clumsy, right? We have to live life on life's terms. There's no other life. We have to live life on life's terms. We are always practicing. There is no perfect. We're not gonna read perfection. The goal is presence. And it takes a life, a life to learn how to live. I was just talking to my, my grandmother, grandma, great grandmother, or my grandmother, she's 96 years old, on her deathbed. Um, and, you know, just looking at her legacy and just sitting in, you know, and just times just listening and remembering all the wisdom that she gave us over the years. But in that time, basically what we saw was, I mean, she was able, she had four grandchildren, ten, uh, four children, 10 grandchildren, 33 great grandchildren and six great, great grandchildren. I was just like, man, and I was just celebrating her life and, and all of that. And it's just kind of like, just now, and now guess what? She's after, she's gotta wrestle with how, how do I die well? Like even at 96, he's still trying to figure out how to live. Like he, we're never gonna figure it out, right? And so the question becomes is how does that make us feel? What does that do to us inside, right? And here they are. We're gonna spend the time here and then we're gonna ask questions, a couple of questions. Here's the eight feelings, right? These are the eight, like there's three. And I want you to look at these like you have, like they're facts. A lot of times we talk about a theology. Right now, I just want to talk about an anthropology. Like how do we live life? And these are the eight emotions, the eight truths about what's going on inside. Eight words that I want us to start using and practicing on how to confess. That's the words of hurt, lonely, sad, anger, fear, sh uh, shame, guilt, and glad. And I know you're looking at the list and the only one you want is glad. But let me just say it at the very beginning. The only way you get glad is if you're willing to do the other seven. There's no way to getting glad. And we'll explain and talk about that. If you recognize this, one of the things that you also see in this is that there's the truth, but then there's an impaired version or there's a gift. Everything can either lead you to the impaired or to the gift, right? And so on the impaired side of Things. And let me just say what an impairment is, is that he was played the game. Like if you went swimming for any amount of time, you played the game about like who can hold their breath underwater the longest. You guys, everybody has done that. If you played, let's go into water. Let's just see how we get it. All right. And then you go under water for a long period of time. And let's just say you're able to stay under for a minute or a minute and a half, however long you're able to stay. When you come out of the water, you do the most selfish thing that you can possibly do. What do you do? What do you do? You, you don't just breathe. You gasp. <gasps> you try to take as much air. You don't care about anybody else getting air. You don't, it is like you try to get as much air for yourself right in there. Um, why? And guess what? Even with all the gasping that's going, even if the world simultaneously gasps, guess what? They'll still have enough air for the other, everybody to survive. What am I saying? There's enough space for you to understand how to truly love yourself and still have enough love for other people, right? But the problem is, is that people live in an impaired version of themselves. So when you are, and we live our lives as if we're living life underwater, 
We're not living as we've been made to live. And also, when you come out of that water, do you have to, in your mind, says, okay, when I get out, I'm going to gasp. No, it's just a natural biological thing. If you are not willing to tell the truth about what's going on inside, your biology will take over. And this is why every time I teach this, a lot of people, they can relate more to the impaired side of things than they can to the truth because they've lived their lives in an impaired space. An impairment is not bad. It just simply means you're in survival. You're in survival mode. Right. But then there's the gift. If we're willing to tell the truth, if we're willing to identify, explore and express, if we're willing to do the work, it would take the time to engage in these. Basically, we'll get a gift. And that gift is how God calls us to live. So what I'm saying is that the eight feelings, they're not bad. They're neither bad nor good. They're just tools that God uses to help us to identify, to be better at confessing and better at repenting. Right. And so what do I mean by that? Hurt. Hurt is the feeling that just says that I'm wounded, that I'm wounded. Right. You guys have ever um, heard the phrase, hurt people do what? Hurt people hurt people. What I would say is hurt people who are not willing to deal with their hurt or confess their hurt become resentful people. Resentful people become revenge oriented people and revenge oriented people hurt people. And in all of these, what I'm going to show you is that if you are not willing to do your own work, you will always force somebody else to do it for you. Your biology will take over. If you are not willing to do your own work, your biology will take over and it will do it for you. So a hurt person, you guys know, is just like when you're hurt, I was like, I'm not going to let them know that I'm hurt. But then you're secretly trying to figure out ways to get them back. Right. Because it's like hurt people hurt people. I remember LeBron James and LeBron this is a few James game years ago. A, long, a while back, he was getting um, Kyrie Irving, which was a guy who was with LeBron James, was um, playing on a basketball floor with him. And then basically um, Kyrie decided to leave and to go to another team. Then they asked LeBron James, they said, LeBron, how did you when you heard the news about um, Kyrie, how did that make you feel? It was a specific question. How did that make you feel? And you know what LeBron did is that he, he, he answered for about a minute. He was, just, he was just like, well, you know, it is what it is. I, you know, I did everything for that. You know, and he just said over and over again, he gave a lot of things, a lot of facts and a lot of stuff. But you know what? He never, ever said one feeling word. You know why? If LeBron said would have said the thing like it is what it is or I was stabbed in the back or like all the colloquialisms that we use. He wouldn't. He never said I was hurt by him, because guess what? If I said I was hurt by him or hurt by that, I've just now empowered him to say you can hurt me. And we would rather not be hurt. And so we got all of the things instead of saying I was hurt. We got all the statements and all the phrases. And then what it is is that we bury it and we go into survival mode and then we begin to resent or we vow to never go on again. Um, but if we're willing to use the gift and we understand this in language and um, just in life, I ruptured both of my patella tendons. I have ruptured playing, you know, in my 30s and beyond. Right. I, I found out that I wasn't 18 years old again. Right. And I ruptured playing, you know, rec foot basketball and rec. And so what happened was is that after rupturing one of my patella, I ruptured 10 years apart. After rupturing one of them, I went to the doctor and I don't know if there's any PT people in here. Any PT people? All right. So I went into the I went into the um, doctor. And so basically in my first surgery, they give you um, they put you in the sling this brace and they keep your legs straight. And basically for the first six weeks, what they, they tell you to do is just allow all the scar tissue to build up around it. So as your bone or as the is being reattached. All right. And then you go back in and, you know, after six weeks and then you start going through your, your PT and in the PT, they literally they take and they start going like millimeters and centimeters. And you just hear the scar tissue cracking in there and you just hear, and, you know, and I just remember hating every minute. And then you got the PTA smiling like, oh, you're doing well, like and you and you're hating every minute of it. And it wasn't just one time I remember going and saying, 
I would rather spend the rest of my life limp than having to go back to do that physical therapy. I would rather spend the rest of my life limp, right? But thankfully, I was willing to go endure the pain that I had to go through so that now I can walk among you. You see, that's, that makes sense because we're probably all broken bones and have to do some type of rehab. But the problem is, is that for us emotionally, it does, it's not as clear. And so what we have is a bunch of people walking around limp because they're not willing to do the emotional rehab go through it. They're not willing to go through the pain of their hurt. And so the gift of it is if you're willing to go through the rehab, you can have healing and you can have courage. So guess what? Even though it was dumb, I got back into it and I start playing rec sports again. And then I ruptured my other patella tendon, right? And when I ruptured my other patella tendon, I didn't cry when the pain, when I first ruptured it, you know, when I cried is when they told me I ruptured my patella tendon because I was triggered with the rehab. I was triggered with the pain and the trauma of it. But guess what gave me courage to go back in again is having gone through the experience. I was able to get back healthy. And if I'm able to go through the pain of that, I mean, if I, I gave me courage to go back through. And ultimately, when we all live through that hurt, it's able, the ability to go into kind of the pain. So hurt is the feeling that this basically says that I've been wounded, that I've been wounded. Um, the next one is lonely. Lonely, loneliness basically is just saying it's the feeling that I'm, I was made for creation. I was made for intimacy. I, I wasn't made to be by myself, right? Lonely people who are not willing to confess their loneliness leaves other people lonely. Lonely people who say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be, forget it. I'm not, I'm not gonna allow anybody to hurt me anymore. I'm just gonna be apathetic. I don't care. I don't care. Nothing's gonna get to me. Right. And what has happened? Lonely people who are not willing to confess their loneliness make other people lonely. They make other people lonely. They're not willing to confess their loneliness that we've been created for intimacy and relationship. But because we've been broken, we've been hurt, we've been scarred, that I'm now going to stand away from that. And, and I'm going to make other people. Lonely. I'm just going to live life. And it's a coping mechanism. I'm just going to not care. I'm just going to not care about life. And lonely people live, other people lonely, right? I'm not willing to confess that I'm lonely, so I'm going to make other people lonely. And this is why when we talked about that crowded loneliness, many of us live our lives like this. Stay away, come closer. Stay away, come closer. Because we know that we've been made for intimacy, but we've been burned so much by letting people close to us. And we don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do with our struggle or that we've been made and desire intimacy, but we've been burned so much and so often. Right. But intimacy, if I'm willing to do the work, if I'm willing to endure the pain of relationship, broken relationships, fractured relationship and endure, you can get intimacy into me. See that, that we can overcome the crowded loneliness. But it's out of our loneliness and our apathy that we stop confessing. I'm not going to tell the truth anymore because the last person I confess to. They burn me. They burn me. Right. So I'm not I'm no longer going to be I'm not going to live the way that I've been made to live. I'm not going to tell the truth about what's going on inside. Right. Which leads to sad. Sad is just simply the experience that you've that you've lost something. I've lost something. You know, um, September 10th is one of the best day, um, best days, but it's also one of the saddest days of my life. September the 10th of 2008 is when my dad died. He played professional football. He died. Uh, glioblastoma, brain cancer, literally was with him in June, healthy, everything. By September, God took him. September the, the 10th, 2008. It's what every, every year I, I take that day and I take some time and I grieve and I lament. This was in 2008, over 12 years ago, or 14 years ago now. People was like, well, you got to get over there. You got to no. It's like, no, I'm going to take every year. And I hope for the rest of my life to take some time to remember, because all I'm doing is I'm I'm trying to honor him. September the 10th. But you also know, and I'm going to talk about a little bit. I mean, I talk about it now, but also September the 10th is one of the most joyful days. September the 10th is also the day my son was born. And so every September the 10th, I am reminded of both joy and sadness. And that's a lot of life. Every day you go and you celebrate both. There's joy, there's things to celebrate, there's life, 
That's coming new things, new opportunities, but there's also grief. There's death and loss, right? And unless we know how to grieve well, we won't be able to live well. So we see that sadness. Sadness is just simply the thing that let us know that we have, we've lost something. We've lost something, right? If we're not willing to confess our sadness, we go into our E or mindset. Oh, I'm just the words of this head, right? And what are we doing? I'm not willing to confess I'm sad, so I need somebody else to do my sadness work for me. Pity me. Pity me. You be sad for me. And let me just say, you can't be sad for someone. You can be sad with someone, but you can't be sad for someone. When someone talks about they lose their dad, you know what? I like, I don't know their relationship, so I can't be sad for them. But you know what it does? It triggers that I lost my dad and I know what it's like to lose a dad. And I'm able to do the empathy work. So as he's grieving his dad, I'm grieving my dad. And I'm being, empathy, I'm, I'm being empathetic with him because I know what it's like to lose a dad. And guess what? I'm knowing how to be present with him. But it's all about my sadness, right? You see, we're talking about human language. I don't care what culture, I don't say what denomi- denomination, I don't care Africa, Egypt, I don't care where you are in the world. The bottom line is, is that everybody has these eight. We're talking about the human language. We're talking about understanding the, how to be empathy, how to, to do empathy. So sad, anger, anger is simply the, the, the feeling that lets you know that, you, that something cares, that something matters, that you only get angry about the things that matter. You only get angry about the things that matter. So when I get angry, the Bible says, be angry, but don't sin. All you're saying is that something matters. Whenever you think about this idea of anger, just go ahead and read the Psalms. When someone tells you to sin, the most angry person in the Bible is God. It says God was angry, angry because things matter to him. Right. But if we're not willing to confess our anger, you know what we do? And many of us do. We live in a life of depression. We suppress the things that matter. What matters? I matter. But I'm too much for people. So what do we do? We suppress ourselves. We try to live in the people's light bubbles. How much of you can you handle? And we're constantly asking that question. So we either shrink ourselves. When we're really happy, we shrink ourselves down. When we're really sad, I don't want to be too much. We're always readjusting ourselves and we're not able to live fully. We're not willing to tell the truth because and we depress, we suppress. Right. And guess what? It's only when you're in a healthy state of anger that you live the life of passion, the gift of passion. What is passion? A willingness to endure the pain for something that's greater than the pain. Why in the world would women continue to get pregnant and go through childbirth? I don't know how many people have had children in here. I've never had a child. Um, Not me, naturally, but my wife has gotten pregnant multiple times. We have seven or six children. Right. What would make her continually go through the pain? Something that's greater than the pain. What would make Jesus go to the cross? Something that's greater than the cross. That's why he talks about the passion of Christ. If you're not willing to live life angry. You will continually suppress yourself and live in other people's boxes, live in other people's worlds. It's only it's your anger. It's the things that matter. And this is the reason why Christ is worthy right? Anger, right? Live life with passion, a willingness to endure pain for something that's greater than the pain. Fear. Fear just simply says that I'm not in control. What do I mean by that? Um, you want to have fear. The Bible talks about um, the beginning of all wisdom is fear. But, you know, people say, well, the Bible says, don't, you know, God did not give us a spirit of fear. The Bible says God did not give us a spirit of phobos. That word in the Greek is phobos is where we get the word phobia. God did not give us the, the ability, the, the spirit to be controlled by our fear, right? But if we take our fear to the right places. So back in the day when I was parenting, great parenting wisdom right here, my son was going and like, we had a downstairs basement and you know, with six kids, you had to have fridges upstairs and downstairs. So in the basement, it was just like, hey son, go downstairs and give me some milk. And it was just like, dad, 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 oh, I don't, like it's scary down there. Like he opened up and it's dark down there. And, and I was just like, what did I do every great dad? This boy, if you don't go down there and just get that milk, <laughs> right? You better, wait, wait, see what am I saying? You better overcome your fear 
and you go down and you break. And basically what he was, he, what he was saying is, dad, I'm afraid. Will you go with me? Will you come down there and go down there with me? Right. He knew what to do with his fear. He was needy. He was able to confess. I'm afraid Dad, will you come with me? Will you? Right. And so what? But what we teach people don't have fear, conquer that. But we want to have fear. Who wants to go on a plane with a fearless pilot? Hey, guys, we're about to go to D.C. And hey, I just want you to know, we're, I don't have a fear in the world. We're going to do some tops and turns and work like, no, you want your person to have a little fear because fear is the very thing that helps you, makes you plan. It helps you do things. It's like when you have healthy fear and that's why healthy fear is wisdom. It's faith, right? All this is I'm not in control, but guess what? I know someone who is. I'm not in control. I have a fear of death. And I know as a pastor and as a leader, I'm not supposed to have a fear of death, but I have a fear of death. And every time I struggle and I wrestle with my fear of death, you know what I do is I go to God in prayer. Lord, you were able to overcome death. You were able. And I'm just just learning. I'm able to confess. So instead of acting like I don't have. No, I can go and I can take it to the person who is in control. Fear just simply says I'm not in control, but I know someone who is. He's in control and I can take all of my fear. This revolutionize, revolutionizes your, your prayer life. Because I'm just able to tell the truth about what's going on inside. Right. But if you're not willing to do fear, you end up trying to control others. You end up trying to rage out on others. You end up trying to. Right. And then you make other people afraid. You guys have lived in those homes, been in those homes, been in those friendship groups that they have people who are afraid to death. They're unwilling to confess their fear and they, they try to control you. They can they control because they're trying to control their environment because it's part of it is that their own fear. Right. And people don't like being controlled. So there's a fear in there. Right. The shame. Shame just says I'm not God. I'm, I'm human. And this is really perfect. The Bible says if you can confess that you're not God it's like God has this perfect like good. You be human and let me be God. And now it would be great, but we want to be superhuman. That's why we all have Marvel, right? We want to be superhuman. We don't want to have needs. We don't want to have, no, it says, no, you be good. So if we don't confess, it's toxic shame. And if we have toxic shame, we become blameless. Like, remember when Adam came in, he was just like, it was the woman you gave me. It's not my fault. It was the parents that raised me. It was my girlfriend. It was my wife. It was like, if you just talk about problems, how many people are really good at just confessing? Oh, it was, it's my fault. I mean, it's rare. What people are, it's always something else. It was the woman you gave me. It was something else because we're not willing to deal with our, our shame, our limitations, because we don't like being limited. We, but guess what? The pandemic showed how much we have. We are, I thought the pandemic was going to take two weeks. We was going to get a two, it was right around spring break, two weeks, and we were about to go on vacation. We were good and come back. Literally, there's some churches in Atlanta who just came back this last Easter. Two years later. There's some churches two years later. And basically what it says is that we are not in control. We're human. Right. But if we embrace that, that that shame leads to humility. I'm, I'm human. I'll be human and let God be God. And now I can come to God. That's where the idea of repentance, repentance. If I'm truly willing to confess and to tell the truth, I'm truly able to live human, to live needy. And now I can go to God with what I need. I'm not trying to be superhuman. I'm trying to be human and go to God in my need. Guilt, and we're in this, guilt is it simply says I've done something wrong. The difference between shame and guilt, shame is about how I was made. Guilt is about what I have done. Shame says, I am a bad person. Guilt says, I have done bad things, right? And whenever you do bad things, you can either go to pride. It's the woman you gave me. You can go toxic shame. Oh God, why do you make me this way? Why do I keep doing this? Like toxic shame, or you can confess and ask for forgiveness. Will you give yourself back to me? I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you give yourself back to me? 
there. And then the last one is glad. Glad, you can only get glad if you're willing to do the other seven. If you're not willing to do glad, joy, ultimately is joy with sadness. But if you're trying to get gladness without your heart, you know what it's called? It's called amusement. It's called addiction. It's called entertainment. It's, it's called all the things. You will still try to get all that you are trying to get. It's called pornography addiction. It's called um um, extramarital affairs. It's called Netflix. It's called romance. It's like, I'm not going to receive love from my husband or from my spouse. So guess what? I'm going to find it somewhere else. I'm going to live somebody else's story. I'm going to get it, but I don't have to engage my heart. Right. And that's what we get with Netflix is that we lose ourselves in somebody else's story. We, we find ourselves, but we don't want to have to deal with the pain of our own life. Right. We try, we, we know that we've been made Right. For 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 sex. Right. But if I don't want to deal with my heart, what do we do? Well, I go find a prostitute that I can have the enjoy. I can have the pleasure of it without having to deal with the heart. We constantly do it. We constantly run to it because, again, your biology is going to take over. That's why the idea of happiness. Happiness is just simply based upon your circumstances. It's trying to engage without heart. Right. If I can control things and that's why we constantly do think about that. Uh, anybody who's won a championship, they don't know that a lot of times if you just look at some some stories, it's like that that high of being on the top. But understanding even for the time I won this championship. Oh, my God. What do we try to do? We try to keep it. But we're gonna, if we don't know how to grieve the loss, because the bottom line is, is that the next day's coming. The next year's coming. I'm no longer going to be a champion. I just sent my, my daughter off to UGA. Uh, she went to UGA Honors College and I'm excited. I'm in joy, so much gladness, but it's also sadness because like, oh, my daughter's like gone. She's leaving the house. That's so sad. I think about all the loss, all the lost opportunities, all the stuff, all the things I wanted to do that I never got to, all the things I, the missed opportunities, the missed things and the sad. So even in our best moments, we still got to learn how to grieve. The sadness and those who are not willing to grieve even their joyful moments, try to maintain their joyful moments. And this is where or why we get addiction. It's constantly trying to reach a high, constantly trying to numb myself. And I'm not just talking about narcotics or drugs. I'm talking about addicted to con we're, we're, we're addicted to our control. We're addicted to a lot of, you know, a lot of things that we do to get away from our heart. It's the things that we do to get away from living life on life's terms. Those are addictive things. And if you just think about that, there's so many of us that are addicted because we try to get away. And so basically what I'm saying here is that the better, best way for us to do is to confess and repent, to be really good at identifying where I am, exploring where I am, and then being able to express what I need. What do I need, right? that we all have a need to belong. We all have a need to matter. We all have a need to be seen. We, have, we all need to be attended to. We all have needs. And if we're not willing to be vulnerable and learn how to be needy, what we will do, we'll live our lives in an impaired state, right? Live our lives in survival mode in that. So stop there. Questions, comments, thoughts little different kind of approach than just simply talking about boundaries and giving and do this and do that. But it's like you have emotions and I think we got to have a better way to be better identify, explore and express kind of where we are so that we can be in relationship, real relationship with one another. So I'm not telling you how to feel. And let me just say this. The goal is not getting glad. The goal is telling the truth. And there's literally times when I wake up in the morning and I'll take a sheet and I have a sheet just like this on, you know, and I'll put it in front of me and I just imagine God saying, well, Daddy, where are you? And I would say, I'm hurt. I'm lonely. I'm sad. Right. And we have times and as in, in, in our DNA groups and, and in our staff, we just take times where we just say, I'm hurt, I'm lonely and I'm sad. And you know what's going to happen is that your logic brain is going to kick in and you're going to start rationalizing. Well, I got to explain why, because I don't want them to think of me. But it's one of the most vulnerable things just to say that and not bring any explanation after it. I'm hurt. I'm lonely. I'm sad. I'm angry. And then there's, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing, right? 
And it's just the discipline of just being able to not have to reason of how of returning to how God made you to be. Right. The bottom line is, is that when you're a child, when you're infant, all a baby has is their cry out. That's all they have is their cry out. And it's when we become more mature is that we lose our cry out because it's not good to be needy. And we go against all of how we were made. And that's why Jesus keeps calling us back, return, return, return back to how you were made. That's the way to relationship, confess. It's hard, but live with passion. Endure the pain for something that's greater than the pain. All right, I'll really stop there. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, I was going to ask, how like, often do you take inventory of these things, like after every meeting, in the morning, as you like feel? Like as oftentimes, body? daily. I start my times with the Lord. There's many times in my journal I write, I'm sad, I'm lonely, I'm hurt. And then, you know, I do at times, because then after you get, I think the first discipline is just being able to be free to say that. The second is to be able to say, okay, what's the story I'm telling myself? I'm lonely. Okay, what's the story? No one cares about me. I'm just, you know, and I tell the story, what do I need? I need to be seen. Right. So I'm just walking through the process. And so now a lot of times I do that work before I go to God in prayer, because I don't oftentimes we can go to God in prayer. And we don't even know what we need because we don't even really know where we are. Right. And so I do the work so I can take my real prayers to God because I've been so good at hiding. Right. Every single every one of my children, they hate these words. They're like, Dad, he's about to do his feelings thing. You know, they run, right? But they they, they know the words. I, I almost, um, about three times, it ends up being about three times a week, but we say every day, my wife, we'll take a 30-minute walk. When I get home, I take a 30-minute walk, and we're asking this question, what do you feel? What do you need? Where are you? And so what we're trying to do is to give people space in the staff. And, and in that, the one rule is that when we start doing this, you can't fix anybody. No one can fix anybody because what we're going to start doing is as soon as someone does it, well, you know, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I mean, just, you know, I can do all things to Christ. And they start giving the scriptures to everybody. And does that make you want to come and share the next time? No, it doesn't make you want to come and share. So what we're doing is that we're helping people to practice to be vulnerable. Right. And if and only if say, hey, I have something about that. Would you uh, allow me to share that with you, share with you? And then if, and if they get permission or if they say that they have a need, it's that, is that because what we do is that we end up asking, we're answering problems that people are not having, right? And let me just say this, it's in us as ministers, if you don't allow a person to get to their need of saying what they need, the best you can do is say, is to, kind of give what you need. You're ministering to yourself because basically what you're saying is if I was in that situation, here's what I would need. No, that's the reason why. No, cultivate. Let them come to what you need. So I would say I've been doing this for 10 years now. We just went through um, a pastor, 20 years in fidelity. We've been through like all of the, the racial tension Like we started realizing I got to We have to talk about this. We got to talk about the feelings and emotions because everyone, we talk about race, everything is traumatic. We are a pastor, a multi-ethnic church, right? We got people who voted for Trump. We got people who think you're the devil because you voted for Trump, like in these worlds coming together. And so when the first time the first election came, we have to bring everybody together. And it was so much trauma. Trauma is just simply an inability to make sense of the past, anticipating something bad in the future happening. And it was everybody and everybody was raging out and everyone. I was like, man, everybody's afraid, but they don't even know. So until we were able to deal with our emotions. So I did a series called 18 inches and just taking our head to our hearts so that we can have conversations with one another. So practice, 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 give people space to practice um, that another. Yeah. Similar question is that when you're when you are the recipient of these things, if it sounds like that person is kind of living in their impairment a lot or kind of continuing to cycle back into that. How do you both listen and receive, but also help yeah. them towards the gift? I think asking questions, 
you know, uh, like what I like to think about genuine curiosity is always the best. Right. Avoid fixing and genuine curiosity. When you say that, well, tell me like what you're what you're thinking. Tell me what's going on inside. Where does that take you? Right. So I've just learned genuine curiosity is one. Just being genuine about like, I wonder how did you get there? What's like asking open ended questions and genuinely trying to find out what's the story? Because regardless of someone is living, they're living in their emotions. Basically above there is a story. Right. There's a story. And then and then there's an expectation. So it's kind of like they're living in the tension between what they expected and what their reality and something they're not getting something about their desire. They're not getting. And so if I can say, what's the story? Right. What are you what are you hoping for? That will help me get to your need. And then it's once we get to that need is then we can get a plan. But we'll get into a plan because if I said, hey, you guys, I hate traveling. I hate traveling. And media is like, well, what we can do is this. you can start traveling certain times. But really what I was saying was where well, my dad played pro football. And the reason why I don't like traveling is because my dad was gone oftentimes, gone playing football, playing sports and all that. And every time I travel, I'm reminded that, like, I'm not going to be with my kids. And, you know, and the idea of not being with my kids, and even when I go home, I'm going to go home tonight. And you know what? When I go home, and this is real. Like when I go home tonight, my kids are going to be like, oh, hi, dad. Like they're not going to be like. I've been going for three days, you guys, because it's like oh, this business as usual. And that makes me really sad. Right. And so what happens is that you'll be fixing the problem of travel. But really what I'm saying is I want to be present with my kids. And you're fixing a different problem than really what my heart is. But until you go through the story, you're answering a problem that I don't really have. You go give me a travel agent, you Right. And I can stop traveling, but not address the problem that I had. So there's a thing you got to differentiate between what people are saying, and what people are really meaning. Right. And it's through the process of taking, helping the people identify, explore and express. So when you do this, people, I'm telling you, if you go and you do this, because we'll have times where we just say, what do you feel? I feel hurt, lonely, sad. And then people want to go into explanation mode. A lot of times what people want to do first, if you do this, the first thing people are always going to say, I'm glad. They're not going to confess anything else. I'm glad. But let me just say, you can't really be glad if you don't have the other ones. Right. But then what people are going to say is that they're going to say it real quick. And then they're going to just go off into explanation mode. What you want to do is sit like, tell me about what's sad. Like, what have you lost? Or if people are angry. Tell me what matters to you right now. Right. So I'm taking these words and I'm just letting people the ability to explore. Right. Sad. What have you lost? Fear. What do you feel like you're losing control of? Shame. What do you, like and I'm using and I'm letting them know that it's OK to feel these things because these things are just helping you to, to identify where you are. But then I want to help people explore those things before I try to ask them to express. So identify, explore where they are, unpack that, get deeper before I try to answer, give them answers or right, before I ask them to express what they need. Other as well. It's about that time. Any other quick questions? All right. Well, I don't want to cut into lunch. Let me pray for us. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. Thank you for giving us these tools, giving us the language. Thank you for helping us to be better at confessing and repenting. Lord, we pray, Father, for that you would help us, Father, to walk in vulnerability, to help us to walk in passion as we try to navigate the fact that life is tragic, but you are faithful. Lord, we need you. Help us to be healthy as we are leading out, leading students for your namesake and for your glory. Father, we love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen.